title of this webinar is State Planning to Harness Emerging Education Technology. We've got a wonderful lineup of presenters for you. I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit uh, first about NASB. Um, we are the only organization, uh, we are nonpartisan and nonprofit, uh, that supports the members of state boards of education. Almost every state has state boards of education, um, and these are the people that sort of sit between the legislature uh, and the uh, State Department of Education. They help to amplify uh, various laws, uh, promulgate rules, set policy, uh, determine priorities. Many of them are involved in strategic planning uh, and what have you. And a lot of the members of state boards are, are they represent the citizen voice. They're appointed by governors. They're appointed by, um, uh, sometimes appointed by legislators. Many of them are elected. Some of them are up for election, in fact, in a, in a couple of weeks. Uh, and that's always an interesting thing for those states that have elected state boards of education. Um, but it's those citizen voices that engage in the process and help drive uh, the policy considerations, the policy making, and supporting excellent practice, which is really one of the things we're gonna, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, today. Let me set a couple of norms for this engagement. This webinar is being recorded. Uh, recording will be uh, distributed. We're also happy to make slides available uh, upon request if people would like uh, copies of the slides. We don't have very many because we really wanna focus on the discussion today and I'll, of course answering the questions that you might be bringing with you to this webinar. We've also enabled closed captioning uh, for your use. Uh, we ask that you use the question and answer box, the Q&A box for any questions that you might have. And again, we'll answer those in, in various ways. Some might be written responses through the Q&A function. Some of them might be posed to uh, uh, panelists and the other presenters, uh, and we'll uh, try our best to answer all the questions that come in. Look to the chat box for different resource links. Each of our presenters may be posting some things. The NASB staff will be posting some things. That's where you'll find um, some of the resources that get referenced. Today, uh, this webinar is really divided into two parts. Uh, we like to do things like that at NASB. The first hour from three to four o'clock Eastern is gonna be presentation and discussion. And then there's a NASB members only session uh, from four o'clock to 4.30 that allows NASB members to interact with our presenters and panelists a little more intimately. And so those of you who are NASB members, stay on at the end and we'll give you instructions about how to um, connect to the, uh, uh, to the uh, members only portion of this webinar. Um, so let me introduce this topic and get us to the to the meat of it. I love the whole notion of education technology. Um, and what, it's one of the things that we've actually done a good bit of writing on here at NASB. In fact, our most recent issue of the State Education Standard, which you see on this slide, was called Technology and Education. And as in every edition of our standard, you will see multiple authors writing about what's happening in this field. Uh, there are articles about uh, computer science. There are articles about uh, AI. Um, I, I did a wonderful interview with um, uh, Richard Collada at ISTE uh, about all the work that they're doing in the advancement of uh, technology education in their, um, uh, in their realm and all the uh, teacher uh, development and strategies that they're using. Um, we also have an ed tech advisory group where we decided we want to engage uh, some members that had specific interest, and some of them have education technology or technology backgrounds, and we wanted to leverage that expertise in guiding and informing NASB's work. We published a policy update on media literacy, uh, as well as a policy update on uh, digital equity. Uh, and we're going to have a, a, one of our conference sessions. I was just on the phone with the people that will be doing that session about uh, implementing AI, both in terms of um, from an from a education perspective, but also within the context of the SEA. Um, we've got, like I said, a great uh, set of speakers today. One of the reasons I love this is because I, I have the strong feeling that we've been um, surrounded by great technology in the education space that has tremendous potential for supporting great learning and student success. And there are some great examples out there about how it's being used to do just that, but we are not making the best use across the enterprise of the technology that's available to us. And I'm saying this in the context of everybody's really kind of a lot of focus on AI right now, but it's, it's, it goes beyond AI. It's just the regular use of technology as a tool, as an enhancement to the educational experience and, and the effective use of that technology that I think is so important. And that's really gonna form the foundation. As many of you know, the federal government recently um, adopted a national education technology plan. And this idea of having a plan, I feel like is really, really important. We see states also 
that have plans. And it's not just the plan isn't the end game. The plan is that roadmap, because what needs to happen from the plan is that you actually have a commitment to actually doing the things and doing the implementation of the different strategies and so forth that have been identified. Uh, some states are adopting standards. Some are being very strong about pro professional development opportunities for teachers, offering the ISTE credentials, um, and working with the higher ed institutions on pre-service training that involves use of um, technology in the classroom. Uh, some states are are are, are um, assessing the quality of different software products and guiding their districts in terms of uh, what things are really uh, useful in terms of making a difference on student outcomes. Um, some are um, doing these things and developing their plans in a very co-designed way and really supporting implementation through you know, leadership training and through staff buy-in and opportunities for staff to interact and engage. Some states are deploying coaching. Uh, in the area of um, effective use of technology. And then, you know, the best states, of course, are using continuous improvement processes to gauge whether what they're doing is making a difference and if it's having an impact, and then strengthening the things that are working and rethinking the things uh, that aren't. Um, so with that, I'm going to start and turn it over to uh, Julia Fallon. Uh, Julia is at SETA which is the State Education Technology Directors Association. They're another one of the amazing partners that we enjoy so much at NASB. Uh, because first of all, I want everybody on this call to understand that if you, you know, whatever state you're in, there's an education technology director who is a member of this association. And so if you're a state board member um, or otherwise work in education and you have an interest in this topic, you ought to get to know who that person is and the kinds of things that they do, because then that becomes a point of, of contact and intersection with some of the questions. One of the things we like to do during webinars like this is what questions can state board members ask to better understand what's going on in their state and the impact that it's having. Julia uh, and the team over at her organization um, are doing some amazing things. They were leaders in the development of the National Education Technology Plan. And so what we wanted to do is have her uh, talk on behalf of that work and on behalf of her organization um, about uh, the national plan. So with that, Julia, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, I'm very excited. I should say that we don't have all of the states representing our thing. We have a, a good portion of the states. So if your state is not one of our members, we'd love to have your SCA is one of our members. Um, we're a small and mighty professional association, as I like to call us. And um, I like to think of our member, our state members in particular, as the implementers and integrators of educational technology policy um, in their states. So we're going to talk a little bit of today about the, the National Ed Tech Plan, because I want to, that's the document that uh, CEDA, our, my organization, helped lead the work for the, de the Department of Education. It was launched in 2024. And I want to talk a little bit about how you can use this document to actually sort of guide some of the other work that you're doing to make sure that technology is infused into uh, the work of the K-12 spaces in your states. Um, and, and the role that state boards can um, be playing and also the questions they can be asking to make sure that they are sort of um, bringing this vision that the NETP puts out there to life. So the uh, 2024 National Ed Tech Plan is the primary policy guiding the use of technology in K-12 education. It provides a vision for integrating technology to improve teaching, learning, and student outcomes. So the purpose of this document, though, is it really emphasizes equity active use of technology and collaborative leadership as foundational goals for modernizing education. I have been saying lately that I think many of us have this sort of nostalgic view. I want to say, and when I say many of us, it's I think of people in Congress have this, this kind of nostalgic view of 1950s classrooms in rows and chalkboards. And we all know that if we were to take away technology in our day-to-day -day life, uh, uh, you probably couldn't get half your work done in your offices, uh, your home might be uh, suffering a little bit, and we want schools to reflect those types of experiences so that students are prepared when they leave our systems. Again, we were, uh, we played a pivotal role in supporting the development of this, um, of this plan, and we did work with uh, Innovate EDU, Project Tomorrow, Learning Forward, and Whiteboard Advisors on the production of this report. So, um, and some of you hopefully will recognize um, those names as well um, in the space. So let's talk a little bit about the divides. There's three divides that we talk about, and the idea is to try to close them. I think when we first started this work back in the mid 90s, we were really talking about access, right? Uh, internet access and devices. Well, we've kind of kind of broadened that to more of a digital equity lens, but the idea is that 
Um, access includes providing connectivity, devices, and resources needed for students to succeed, regardless of their location or their socioeconomic status. So you want to think of it as making sure, and I know the pandemic just happened and we all have um, uh, our ex own experiences and feelings about uh, that time, but kids are now taking those devices back and forth, even when they come back to the original, the, the their school buildings. So they're not, some of them have opted out for more online experiences for their uh, parents have opted their students out for more online, but a majority of kids are back in brick and mortars and they're taking those devices back and forth and they need to be able to have access not only at school, but also when they're home to be able to do class projects, do research, complete their homework. They're probably using a learning management system um, and communications, right? Where we find that schools are using communications and electronic communications as a major uh, communications channel. I have a sophomore in high school. I now get 14 flyers via email versus um, in, some, in her backpack. So I, I do appreciate that. There's less paper that's floating around. So that's access. Active use is something that we talk about where it's not just about act, it's, it's not just about the access, but it's about actively using the technology to enhance learning. So examples of this are we want students to be creators. We want them to be um, um, hands-on engaging into the application and not just doing like a worksheet that you can now have online. We want them to actually be creating and exploring and critically thinking the content that they're using. So we're really talking about active um, use and universal design for learning really helps people get into that content and it's a great framework. And we talk a little bit about that in the article, but I encourage you to also check out the UDL framework um, if your state hasn't adopted that yet. The big one that we really focused on in the 2024 um, National Ed Tech Plan is design. So we found that even if you have access and even if you think about your vision for creating these active things, if educators do not have the time and the space to actually effectively integrate technology into their lessons, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter if you have those other things. And I think this is what we found during the pandemic is teachers didn't have necessarily all the skills in order to one, move and shift completely to online and what kind of instructional strategies work for that environment but also back in their classrooms, how are they integrating technology? And we talk about the design divide, not as district to district, it's classroom to classroom. And sometimes it's the luck of the draw. If my, my daughter has an opportunity to be placed in a class with no, you know, like it's just like it's biology 101, we may have one teacher in one classroom that's using technology and using it in an active way and an engaging way. And another teacher is teaching the same section of biology, same content, but not using it. There's two vastly different experiences that a student has basically access to and everything else. So we want to, the NETP encourages educators to design inclusive, interactive, and personalized learning experiences that cater to diverse student needs. And again, UDL is one way that you can get there. And that and UDL is actually written into law so uh, folks should be using that um, as they think about design. I'm gonna talk a little bit, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of an overview of the NETP, and I'm gonna drop actually the link to the, the full document if you'd like to go ahead and, and read it um, into the chat. Let's talk a little bit about state planning. So we don't have a lot of data on how many states have actually separate digital technology uh, ed tech plans. And we didn't really want that to be the focus anyway. We want to be thinking about if you have a portrait of a graduate or you already have competency, a competency skills framework or standards that you think about how you can use the NETP and make sure that you're embedding those types of um, foundational uh, pillars into what you already have. Again, we want students to be able to have the experiences that one, prepare them for uh, success post-secondary. We want teachers to have the skills um, to create these engaging experiences so that students can know what it's gonna be like on the outside and, 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 and that sort of thing. But um, what we're finding is many states are aligning their ed tech strategies with the NETP framework but then that means it reflects it in their portrait of a graduate or their competency frameworks. So doing that alignment and seeing if that alignment is happening uh, with all of the pillars, right? Access, active, and design, active use. What we're seeing is the pandemic, I, I know that uh, folks have feelings about the pandemic, but there's also silver linings that we like to say that came from the pandemic. 
um, it really accelerated digital learning adoption across the United States. If there was any, I, I can't imagine that happening 10 years prior. I think we would have seen a completely different experience, but because it happened when it did and we had access to the tools that we have, I think it went better than it could have gone, um, but it really helped just push that. And I thought that I would never see maybe the United States completely connected. I can actually see that now um, in terms of like the connectivity and the access divide. So what you're seeing is um, it, it sort of is pushing states into investing in technology and infrastructure. And we're seeing that both at the federal level through the Infrastructure Jobs Act and the BEAD programs. We're also seeing that um, via states specific initiatives as well, not just in the K-12 space, but across as a state thinking about how they're going to meet the needs of their, um, their uh, state uh, residents. States have made significant strides in bridging the access divide in, during the academic, but challenges really do still remain in rural areas. So we wanna, I know that I, I'm based in Washington state. We have places where they're not gonna be digging through a volcanic rock to lay broadband. So we need to be really thinking about different ways that we can serve those communities that are not gonna get an influx of thousands and thousands of people, right? To make it a cost or ROI from a company perspective, but how do we look at private and public partnerships to, to really accelerate that um, co connectivity. Uh, I wanna say that uh, there's an increased adoption of competency-based learning frameworks and portrait of graduate initiatives in several states. And Lou, I have to apologize, well, I'm gonna apologize on behalf of Whiteboard. Uh, Kentucky got marked off in the wrong spot. I just asked the question like, wait a second. Um, and you had just mentioned earlier during our uh, prep call about uh, having a portrait of a learner in 2022. So there's a, a couple of other adoptions here, but they're, they are increasing this uh, adoption of those competency-based learning models and portrait of graduate. And there's a growing focus on personalized learning, real-time assessments, and blended learning models to meet diverse student needs. So we are seeing again with that influx of online learning options, that's an option. It could be an option even from a rural space where I need a computer science course. I only have two students that wanna take it. They might be able to either do a cooperative service model with some neighboring districts to offer a class where it comes in through online, or they may just be accessing a teacher somewhere else um, to be able to get those uh, access to those high quality courses. And in some regions, um, in terms of national and regional trends, in the Southwest and the West, they're actually leading in integrating digital learning into their competency frameworks. Um, so that's what we're finding. Um, and in terms of rural states, they still are fa facing some unique challenges, but they're developing pretty innovative solutions to improve connectivity and digital resources. So we're seeing this big push that's happened post pandemic. And this is the first uh, national ed tech plan since um, 2017. So we're very excited that we were able to sort of take lessons learned from the pandemic and help inform where we can go. Click on the next slide. So what are some things that states can do to adopt or adapt the NEPTP framework? And I kind of put this in the lens of questions because and it's, and it's cyclical in some ways, they're all connected to one another and I'm hoping that I sort of give you that visual, but the idea is how do we, um, and it's iterative, right? Like you're gonna, con con this is not a one and done. You're not gonna go out and buy machines and access for everybody and then consider yourself done. You need to continue to keep through this. So how can we ensure a question that a state board can ask is how can we ensure equitable access for all students and educators? Well, some things that you can be focusing on is infrastructure devices and connectivity. And while it's not ed tech specific, there are lots of buildings, school buildings, right? Schools construction is happening that needs to take place, right? We know that our infrastructure in terms of our school buildings is um, replaced. What are we doing in the construction process too to make sure that those are spaces that digital access and devices can work, right? Building with cinder block might not be an option anymore because that does block your Wi-Fi um, in certain places, but to be thinking about as an infrastructure um, in particular school buildings, how are you, how can, how can it support? So again, focusing on infrastructure devices and connectivity. The next Julia, question, if I could, uh, yeah. let me add one thing to that, because in addition to asking how we can ensure, you might also want to ask what the current state of that is in your state. Like how many school buildings are in fact wired to a certain standard, because that way that paints a picture of the current state and then helps guide your discussions about what the future state, how you try to get to the future state. Sorry to interrupt, totally. but I wanted to make that point. 
Yeah, totally. And it, it's going to be unique based on your states too, right? Uh, urban versus rural and funding levels and infrastructure limitations and, and things of that nature. So some things to just be thinking about, right? Um, uh, you know, rural states might prioritize improving connectivity while urbans might be focusing on scaling up professional learning, right? So again, looking at the different ways that you put this together. So another question is, what professional learning strategies support teachers in integrating technology? Well, you want to maybe emphasize continuous support. Uh, Every Student Succeeds Act really talks about job embedded, you know, uh, sustainable professional learning. And we want to see that. And then maybe it's not about them learning how to use a particular tool. If you're a science teacher, then maybe I need to be thinking about how technology supports a particular content, you know, standard that I'm trying to reach. Or um, I know everybody's talking about AI because that's what I feel like I'm talking about AI half the time if I'm not talking about cybersecurity. <laughs> But how does AI then support that? You know what I mean? Or what tools are available? Or what kind of literacy? I, I think about um, good chatbot queries are actually based out of social studies. You're asking good research questions, right? So how do you get better? So there's ways to align some of those um, standards in some ways. But again, really emphasizing continuous support and digital tools, right? Like how are they getting access to that and everything else? The next question is, how can we adapt our digital learning plans to our unique state needs, right? A question we ask. Well, you want to address those urban versus rural challenges and funding constraints um, and, and whatnot. And I really want to say that I think that um, state boards lead the way, in essence, because they're setting policy, they're creating governance structures, and, and hopefully... In some ways, you're ensuring that resources are allocated effectively, right? And you can also advocate for sustained funding and, and establish professional learning programs that can help educators integrate technology in meaningful ways. The other question is, how do we build partnerships, though, to enhance digital learning? This is not K-12's lift alone at all, right? You need to be thinking about how it does connect to other initiatives that are going on in your states and whatnot. And again, State agencies could be collaborating with one another, they could be collaborating with tech providers, and they could also be leveraging federal programs that are out there. So I just want you to be thinking about how states can create or update their digital learning plans to reflect the NETP report priorities, as well as really thinking about how they ensure that all students have access to quality digital resources, and that how does these state agencies and local agencies too, and tech providers and federal programs support infrastructure upgrades and professional development that is out there? I, um, before I came to CEDA as staff, I actually was in the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction in Washington State. And we often talked a lot about how Title II, right, is for professional learning, but a lot of folks and a lot of um, local uh, education agencies leave that money on the table from year to year, but we, how do we help them see how they could use those funds in order to implement NETP? And you could be as state boards asking those questions of your SCAs. All right, so the big question here is how will your state shape the future of teaching and learning? And the interesting thing is some people always wanna say future of teaching and digital learning. It's not digital learning, it is learning. It is like, we need to start dropping this like it's some special thing, it is yeah. learning today and to move away from this idea of this 1950s classroom of books and textbooks it is literally how do we collaborate create um and uh uh critical thinking skills and all the things that we've been talking about for the last 20 years right in terms of of what we need for students to have uh, to be successful so Again, one of the things that I think state boards can do is I, I believe they have a very pivotal role in driving, right, uh, the integration of technology by adopting these NETP strategies. So taking a look at the NETP strategies and how does that inform or support the work that you're already doing. I often will say no state's coming out and saying digital learning is my top priority. It's not. It's educator retention. Well, what are you doing to make sure that teachers have the skills in order to become better teachers? Or it's, you know, high quality digital materials. Well, what are you doing to create those kind of um, experiences? And I want to encourage you all to take action by prioritizing policies that ensure equitable access technology for all students and educators. So thinking about how that happens. Um, one of the other things to do is to consider the needs, the unique needs of your local school districts. Um, whether they're rural or urban, and then to implement policies that address the digital divides by, you know, supporting teacher training and improving infrastructure. Again, 
it's not a one size that maybe that fits all. It's going to be different depending on your unique um, uh, situations and challenges within your states. And then I'm going to talk a little bit, a little bit about state exemplars because we want to let you know that there's places that um, are out there. And I wanted to add one more uh, link into the chat and I just got to go grab it. Um, as part of the NETP work, we really try to make sure that we had an example from all of the um, states, including US territories. So you can, you may not find a state level, but you might find a local example. So you can at least find something that's going on in your state to uh, build upon. So first state we're gonna talk about is Mississippi. And people I think don't often think about Mississippi as being a leader um, in many things when you look at the rankings list, but actually they are very much a leader in the digital learning space. Um, during, uh, they implemented a digital, a digital learning coaching program during the pandemic to help educators and districts use data and technology effectively. It has been hailed as a, a great example of talking about accelerating and taking advantage of the pandemic. Uh, and moving things forward. And they also um, created a instructional guide with experts to assist educators in evaluating and improving their own tech implementation. So it's really helping support that teacher design divide. The next one we have is North Carolina. North Carolina launched a digital competency framework as part of their digital learning initiative. They offer extensive training and peer mentoring for teachers. And they also um, empower teachers and educators to effectively integrate technology, enhancing student engagement and learning outcomes. So they have all of this on their website, but they are also they have this in terms of peer and the competencies. And then Massachusetts, um, we always talk about like show me the data. Uh, they actually pioneered a data different data driven instruction through using its education data warehouse, it gives educators actually the tools to analyze student data and personalize learning. So here's a here's an infrastructure thing, right? They're providing a way for teachers to, to really tailor for their students. Um, one thing I should mention, because we always wanna talk about access in terms of like security as well, we want things to be secure and safe. Uh, they also maintain very strict data privacy standards while they enable more of that tailored learning approaches, right? So they're, they're finding that balance there, but here again is where three states have done great work in trying to implement the, the NETP um, uh, strategies. So I'm gonna leave it at that and I believe I get to hand it over to Lou in Kentucky. You Thank do you. indeed. And Lou was involved as a State Board of Education member on behalf of uh, and representing her great state in the work of developing uh, the plan. Lou, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, that. Yes, thank you so much, Paolo, and thanks so much, Julia, Julia, for the um, segue this morning or this afternoon as we talk a little bit about Kentucky. I'm going to set my timer here to make sure I don't go crazy about the amazing Commonwealth of Kentucky. Um, <laughs> we, you all may have heard that uh, Mark Twain once famously quipped that uh, when the end of the world comes, he wants to be in Kentucky because everything happens 20 years later there. So that's not true when it comes to ed tech. In fact, Kentucky has been a leader in educational technology um, since 1990. The sweeping Kentucky Education Reform Act included the establishment of the Kentucky Educational Technology System. And our original associate commissioner in that office, David Couch, 32 years later now from uh, 1992 to the present is still the associate commissioner over the Kentucky Education Technology System. And that uh, longevity and leadership, as has already been mentioned, is actually very rare. Um, I don't know if he'll watch this webinar, but if he, he has announced that he's going to be retiring at the end of the calendar year, and we can't quite imagine it in Kentucky. So that longevity of leadership with a big vision for integrated educational technology services for every learner in Kentucky has been an important part. Uh, it's part of the fabric of who Kentucky is. Uh, like Julia, I want to share some uh, resources over in the chat, so I'll keep adding those. The first of those, also um, a best practice recommended in the National Ed, ed Tech Plan, is that um, all states should have a master educational technology uh, integration plan. And we have one in Kentucky. It's our second iteration. Um, we have statutory requirements for a six-year plan. So this is 2024 to 2030. Uh, I invite you to take a look at that. It really is quite comprehensive. Kentucky for um, decades now has led the nation in a variety of um, uh, 
Im strong implementation examples in um, in ed tech, including things like um, the first state in the nation to um, uh, implement internet access in every school in the Commonwealth. People don't know that about Kentucky. Um, the one of the things that makes us very different is, and CETA did a report uh, earlier this year that highlighted Kentucky in this way is, despite the fact that we're a very local control focused state, in fact, we even have school-based um, advice, uh, school-based councils at our high, at every school in this Commonwealth and who actually govern their schools um, beyond the expectations of the local board of education. Despite that emphasis on local control, Kentucky has done a really, really good job thinking about infrastructure in a more centralized way. Um, we were the, one of the first states to go to full cloud-based computing uh, for educational administration. We have a statewide student information service, a system, excuse me, a statewide financial system. And the reason I highlight that is because what's happened, the efficiencies and the equity that results from that kind of a state level focus and concentration on infrastructure, I think makes us really unique. In addition to that, Paolo, I wanna emphasize that we have the infrastructure focus, but Kentucky also has a strong focus on innovation. And um, as Julia mentioned, we are one of the states with a uh, portrait of a learner. And when I look at the Kentucky portrait of a learner, I'll put a link over in the chat. Let me grab that. Um, you can't do, you can't help our students attain the competencies of our Kentucky portrait of a learner and tease technology out of it. So I don't know if I can share, Paolo. I, I'll just put the link if I can't. Yeah, that'd be great. Try really quickly. Um, just to, yeah, here we go. Thank you. So to take a look at that, um, how would we prepare all learners to be empowered learners? without digital access and um, teachers who are designing that access and use on the part of students. Creative contributors. We found uh, Julia's team and COSIN and others have found a big discrepancy between the kinds of tasks that poor students and students of color are often asked to do with technology as compared to middle-class and more affluent students they're more creative in the use of technology. They might have multiple devices. They might have multiple softwares and applications that they use as opposed to lower level skill and drill kind of technology integration. So the way kids are using technology is a huge equity concern. So we don't get kids to become creative contributors when they leave primary, intermediate, middle, high, and post-secondary if we are not hel helping them to use those integrated technology tools and thinking about the use of technology in an interdisciplinary way. They can't be productive collaborators on their own without a set of collaboration tools like a Google suite or um, SharePoint. They um, it, it, Critical thinking, how, how often do we rely on uh, databases and spreadsheets and other tools that our students need, effective communicator, I could go on and on, but really catalyzing the um, effort around the design, access, and use of technology around our portrait of a learner has been pivotal for us in Kentucky. Um, I also wanted to mention that we have, um, Julia talked about some of these things too, when it comes to professional learning, that's the design side of the house. We've deployed hundreds of digital coaches across Kentucky. As Julia mentioned, a lot of that in response to the pandemic, but also the desire of teachers to have competency-based, just-in-time, tech-infused professional learning of their own. So this reciprocal experience between young learners and adult learners in our system and leveraging technology in order to make that high quality is really important to us as well. Um, I think I also wanted to touch on, I have uh, one, Kentucky is, was at the time, a few months back, one of 17 states with AI guidance. So to my colleagues on state boards of education uh, on the webinar today, um, the takeaways, these are in that standards article that Joey posted over in the chat, but one of the big takeaways for us, of course, is all things policy and um, guidance and certainly regulatory support that we can provide for this work. And so here's Kentucky's AI guidance document, uh, fairly new, but um, timely. And teachers 
have at least some direction. We're always trying to peep around the corner when it comes to ed tech uh, about what to, you know, how we can support teachers in, in the unknown, in the uncertainty of what really is around the corner. And artificial intelligence is just this year's challenge, right? Uh, but thinking about as a state board, how do we uh, cast a vision for the importance of the um, innovation around and the infrastructure all related to um, highly integrated, well-designed educational technology is what we've been working on in Kentucky. And I just really honestly couldn't be more proud of our system for a lot of those firsts, but it really becomes a culture. It becomes a mindset. So to my state board colleagues, uh, there are lots of things that we can do, do thinking oh. about that vision for learning, for professional development, thinking about infrastructure. How do we pro procure um, technology systems in such a way that it does promote consistency and equity across our system. Paolo, you had a question. Uh, no, I was just going to say thanks for that great overview of Kentucky. I'm going to now pivot to a couple other states that are also uh, doing some excellent work. I'm going to start uh, with Melanie Haas, who's the vice chair of the State Board of Education in the great state of Kansas. She is also participating in our um, EdTech Advisory Committee. So, Melanie, why don't you introduce uh, the listeners to uh, the work of the Advisory Committee? And you guys are doing some exciting work in Kansas. Tell us a little bit about that. And, and thank you, Lou, and thank you, Julia. Um, it was a late arrival, so I'm kind of catching up. Here I am, a technologist, and I'm the one that posts in the chat to everybody the question that was met for just one person. So got to love that. <laughs> um, so like I said, I have a background as a technologist. Um, I was first a software engineer, and I actually worked on an early ed tech startup and then had a full career in technology and decided to take that combined experience uh, to the State Board of Education when I realized what was before us as COVID set in, right? So I ran for office in 2020 and was watching, you know, my kids were coming home from elementary and early middle school at that time with devices. And I could definitely see from where I was as a parent and a professional in the tech space, our state board did not have anyone seated of, of the 10 members um, who could even begin to understand what that meant, both from the parent perspective as well as just understanding kind of how software works. Um, and so when I think about technology, you know, there, there's always the, the kind of tug of war between devices, um, what we call ed tech. You know, you think about software, there are a lot of different facets to that. Um, I just wanted to bring some kind of expertise to share with that board. And just because I'm a technologist, that doesn't mean that I think that all kids should be using technology. Um, it's really about what problem is technology solving for us? It needs to be part of the solution to a problem, um, hopefully in this case to a learning challenge. And so more recently here in Kansas, um, we're seeing changes like behavior issues, referrals to the office, um, you know, fighting uh, for the fighting for the purpose of shooting a video for social media, right? That's That was really um, one of the big things that made us start looking to what do we need to be thinking about when we think about students' personal devices. Um, you've got distractions during, during class time, homework time, um, and then the mental health issues. And that's just kind of scratching the surface of what that whole conversation looks like for us. And so the State Board of Education, as part of these conversations, we decided to establish a Blue Ribbon Task Force, which gave us kind of a flexible space to grow a group of advisors. And so we have um, 36 members. We have representatives, two of us from the State Board. We have superintendents, principals, students, parents, IT staff, um, some local board members, and some legislators. We specifically did not put IT, um, anyone from the ed tech space on the task force or anyone from say the, the psychology mental health space because we wanted to have those folks and come and, come and present to the task force. So the task force was designed to take in the information and then essentially provide um, advice and ultimately a recommendation to the state board as to how we should proceed. And so like Lou was talking about, Kansas is also a very, um, we defer local control to those local boards state, right? We have 10 elected members at the state level. We are not in a position where we would actually look to all 286 of our school districts in Kansas and say, we're going to recommend that you ban cell phones bell to bell for these grades or those grades. We would never, what we wanted to do was come up with a document that we can put forth to the districts and say, here's what the experts told us. Here's what this group of people decided sounded like a good path forward. 
here's something for you to consider local boards. So have your conversations and then you guys decide what you want to do in your schools. And so far, I think that that's been received really well. We kicked this off about five weeks ago. We've been meeting weekly on Zoom for about an hour and a half every Thursday. We've been bringing in experts um, from all of those different spaces that I talked about. And we're really focused on um, the use of personal devices in schools, the use of school devices, and how much access parents have to those devices, like what that relationship with the school looks like. And then really what role does all of that play in students' mental health? And so I'm optimistic that we will arrive at something, you know, 36 people, we have a really diverse group of, I mean, I'm a politician, right? So from the far left to the far right, I think we've kind of run the gamut on the different types of folks that we could have on the task force or on, on the, yeah, on the task force. And I see that only as a good thing. So we will have a decision here in the next um, month, probably early November, We'll kind of be wrapping up that task force. And at the same time, I'm just trying to keep my eyes around the country, you know, and, and pay attention to what you all are doing. And as you've heard today, like the research is coming out as fast, the information comes fast, and it's like every day, you know, set up those Google alerts because there's constantly new information coming out. So. So thank you for that, Melanie. And, you know, that's a really good example. Sometimes this work is very issue focused, right? You you know, we're seeing a lot of states dealing with cell phone use. We're seeing a lot of states dealing with AI. Uh, you know, maybe they're dealing with some access issues uh, and what have you. Uh, but it's it's really the, how all those things get woven together sometimes that's really important. So I'm going to turn it over to Adrian Hale. Adrian is one of the regents on the New York State Board of Regents. Um, he and I first, talk, he's a relatively new member, and I try to reach out to new members and have a good conversation. And he brought up the fact that he was part of a group that's rethinking and revamping the New York uh, Education Technology Plan. Adrian, tell us what y'all are doing and how it's going. Uh, you're muted there. Don't mind. If, hey, there everybody. you go. So if you don't mind, I got a couple of slides for you uh, really quick. Please and do. You would think by now I would know how to get off of mute before <laughs> I start talking. Okay. All right, perfect. So I'm Adrian Hale. I'm one of the regents from New York and I represent Greater Rochester. So that's eight counties, 72 school districts, 28 colleges and universities, and four BOCES districts, which I'll get into a little bit in the presentation here. But in New York, we are doing a lot of cool stuff. So I want to run through the presentation really quick about what the Technology Policy and Practice Council is, why do we need to bolster up our Office of Ed Tech, where we are now in our process, what our Blue Ribbon Commission recommendations are really quickly, what next steps are and necessary stakeholders that we're going to be courting along the way. So our Technology Policy and Practice Council, or what we call just the TPPC, is a group of experts in ed tech from across the state, folks who have done phenomenal things like underwrote the technology on search engines. Some of them were around for the beginning of the internet, desktops, laptops. I mean, very accomplished individuals from across New York who help inform the Board of Regents who are from very diverse backgrounds like myself. I'm a workforce developer by trade, but they help inform us on what ed tech and tech policy should look like. So if you can see here, they were established back in 2004, and they comprise various different stakeholders groups from across the educational ecosystem, from K-12 um, to the BOCES and others. Oop, I went too fast. So here you can see that here, just public and private BOCES, libraries, museum. And for many people who don't know, the regions oversee all of that in New York, from libraries, museums, public radio, public television. We oversee the whole gamut. So... The reason we want to bolster what we have now, which is our Office of Digital Tech to Educational Technology, is because putting technology in classrooms is by itself insufficient to accelerate learning. I think I heard in your presentation, Julia, you want to not just digitize the status quo, but you want to rethink how we educate using tech altogether. And I'm going to get to how we're thinking about that in New York. Many states lack teachers who are willing and prepared to leverage digital tools to deepen and hasten learning. And then ultimately, we want to build support for a statewide digital teaching and learning program in New York. So in 2007, that was the first time the TPPC made recommendations to the Board of Regents on what we should do here. And all this is public information. I can leave these links for you, but I just wanted to show you what that original recommendation plan looked like. And within that recommendation plan, they broke it down into three areas. 
digital capacity around assessing and analyzing digital current um, educational tech capacity from across the state, the digital content, which was assessing and analyzing the current digital educational content within New York State. Using is just a fancy word for how we govern all of education within New York State to include higher ed, K-12, so on and so forth. And then digital use, how we actually integrate it into classrooms and how you're going to see later, we're going to come up with something called applied standards where we evaluate what students can actually do with technology. I think I heard you say, Lou, about seeing the disparity in what we're asking low income students to do versus more affluent and middle class students to do. So here are the, the actual recommendations that were in those three buckets. And I mean, I don't have enough time to go through all of them because I want to get through my time, but just the collective vision and strategy, systems thinking, statewide telecommunications, student to computer ratios being five to one or better, the type and frequency of technology used in New York schools, taken under review, standards being raised significantly for problem solving, building teacher proficiency, use of tech and administrative purposes, and then accessing the tremendous resources we have from a digital standpoint. Now, I'll just use this as a caveat. These were the recommendations in 2007, which you'll see post our Blue Ribbon Commission recommendations. We also know we probably need to revisit these and see if these are the eight guiding recommendations in 2024. Some will stand, some need to be updated, and some don't even exist yet. So, those recommendations went into implementation in 2010. Again, this is public knowledge. I can provide you with it. But we actually created that technology uh, educational tech plan or statewide learning tech plan, which is how we want to implement the recommendations from the TPPC. And now getting to the Blue Ribbon Commission recommendations, which just came to us in November of 2023. And what this is going to do is give us the landscape to integrate technology in meaningful ways. What do I mean? We all know technology is a bureaucracy. The way we do things, I think you said it when you kicked us off, Julia, it's very 1950s in our thinking. And what we're going to do in New York is change some of that. Four major transformations that are a part of the Blue Ribbon Commission recommendations, even though there's 12 recommendations total. The first is adopting the portrait of a graduate, which is us saying this is what we want to see in the finished product when they graduate in New York. Lou, you talked about the portrait of a learner. Same concept. Second is we want to redefine credit. So organizing diploma requirements by components of the portrait of a graduate, add new requirements for CTE and financial literacy, and expand ways for students to show evidence of proficiency in learning standards and the components of portrait of a graduate, which is huge. Right now, credits are allocated based on time and seat. Now they're going to be allocated based on students growing in those competencies and proficiencies. Last, we're going to have a single diploma. So students no longer have to pass the Regents exam, which right now there's a series of exams you have to take within New York State in order to graduate. If you do not pass those exams, you cannot graduate. So we're going to be removing that out of the way, too. And then last but not least, going to a single diploma and creating various seals and endorsements to speak to what kids are capable of doing. So we're going to vote on that next month. So you see a year after we got the recommendations given to us, we're going to take a vote next month month, I can tell you I'm going to vote in in in, a, in a, for it. I hope my colleagues vote for it. And then after that, you'll see this here. How We're looking at how many states currently have an Office of EdTech that is bolstered with the resources, what's the cost, staff, scope of responsibility, industry partner relationships. And then also, how do we integrate what we have now as resources go to help inform the transition from what we have now to what we know that we need? And then next steps being continued, updating our standards and particularly around applied standards, meaning having kids demonstrate things such as um, prompt engineering with artificial intelligence, things of that nature. Those are things we're going to look for. Identifying external sources of funding to do this work, integrating the TPPC in a new way. They're very anxious to get involved once we get beyond the Blue Ribbon Commission recommendations. We're also having conversations in New York around regionalization just due to different allocations of students across the state. Technology is going to make everything from digital learning or virtual learning is going to help us in that regard as well. And the way we think about learning move into a 24-7 landscape, right? Not just when kids are in school, but 24-7. And then along the way, obviously, we're going to court each other, the different committees that are involved, the governor's office across the street from us in Albany. The Senate members, in particular here, the Committee on Internet and Technology, 
And then last but not least, our New York State Assembly Committee on Libraries and EdTech and the Committee on Science and Technology. So that's what we're doing in New York to kind of take ourselves and the rest of the state into the 21st century. Adrian, thank you so very much for that. Outstanding. So um, I have been peppering in the chat a few observations about different questions uh, state boards can ask aligned to some of the different aspects of the National uh, Education Technology Plan, and then also reflecting on some of the points uh, Adrian was raising. In fact, I'm writing one more here about uh, one of the last slides you had about the importance of implementation and follow up. But what I want to what I want to ask you all, and again, I want to remind people, please put your questions in the Q and A function, um, and um, and uh, we'll make sure we answer those as we go forward. Um, but but that th that question of implementation and support, um, some of your states have an office of education technology support. Others, you know, maybe aren't that serious about it. If I were to look into a state education agency, what are the types of things? You, you think I should see that are indicative of a very serious commitment to both a strong education technology strategy and solid implementation. Julia, I'm gonna maybe start with you to comment on that if that's okay. Sure, so um, our latest trends report that just came out last month talks about Office of Ed Tech. So about 56% of um, states have Office of Ed Tech. That number was actually lower um, when we first started our, our trend survey in 2022 because I think people found with the pandemic like, oh, we had one, we probably should put it back together. And I had just dropped in the chat um, we actually um, are dropping a day one uh, Federation of American Scientists memo about the need for having an Office of Ed Tech and the reasons why. So hopefully you can use that um, for some justifications for those states that don't have one. But we also have a research um, proposal out there that we're working with Chiefs for Change um, to actually talk about what that would be, like what it would cost, what are different models that are out there. Um, in the hope that we're going to reauthorize the SEA one day, because it's been about 10 years, right, since that happened. And could we actually have some more dedicated federal funding in that arena, right, to help, you know, implement the NETP going forward? So um, we see different models. Some of them sit in CIO offices or they are the CIO. We see others ones where they're sitting more on the academic side. But again, it really depends, I guess, on your state and how you're set up politically and um, how your org charts look. So I, I will leave it at sort of that, yes, but it others, has grown in the last couple of years. Anyone else want to co comment on that sort of the state infrastructure around this work and its importance? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say just from my end, and because we do have an office of ed tech now, but we know it's nowhere near where it needs to be. And our goal is to really bring our ed tech office to the same standard as our adult career and continuing education services office and our P12 office, which is outfitted with standards, instruction, pedagogy. I think in this case, we need folks with R&D. We need community and industry partnerships. Like it needs to be its own major operation. And I'll tell you just with me coming from industry, similar to Melanie, she talked about her background, you know, coming from blockchain tech, coming from the Chamber of Commerce world, I understand how not just New York, but as a country, we cannot afford to lose the battle for the future. And I think a lot of the growing pains we're going through now in this period of transition where, you know, many of us across the country, I'm sure Lou, Melanie and others, we all feel it in our states, the pressure of connecting education to work because kids need to know that there is a they're there at the end of their education and that there's the prize of a gainfully employing job. But the reality is the jobs of the future are going to look very different. And we have to be extremely forward thinking as we put together these offices of ed tech, because even for our kindergartners now, you all, they're going to live in a world very different from the one we're even living in now. When I was growing up, we still had VHS, v VCRs, and you had to run around with the CD players and Walkmans, and now look what we have, right? So we have to prepare our young people today for that world, and that's gonna require some imagination, some resources, and a little bit of us taking bets on what we think is gonna take off so we can strategically position ourselves to have a competitive advantage over what we know we're competing with kids and schools and workforces of other countries now. That's just, yeah. that's just the reality that we're in. Yeah, yeah, and you know, 
so so a, an office means that there are people getting up every day thinking about That's how right. to you know how to drive right. the idea of uh, integration of technology as its effective use in terms of supporting student success. At the same time, you don't want to siloize it. You want to make sure it's being integrated and collaborating with all the other. It, it has a role to play in teacher prep. It has a role to play in uh, instructional, you know, and, and pedagogical practices. It has a role to play in standard setting. Right? How do you, how do you create you know curricular experiences that use technology in the interest of the different you know subject uh, mat areas? that are part of the uh, part of the learning experience. I love what Julia said early on about, you know, strategies that personalize the learning that, you know, make it more inclusive, make it more interactive, make it more relevant. You know, this this has implications for chronic absenteeism. If people are excited about students are excited about coming to school, uh, they're likely to you know, make sure there's greater attentiveness to being there uh, to engage in that kind of learning. Um, I, I'm, I'm, what I want to do is give everybody like one last opportunity uh, to sort of offer a piece of advice. You've seen me suggesting uh, different questions, uh, the kinds of things that maybe a, a, a state board member that is maybe during this webinar for the first time sort of thinking deeply about, OK, yeah, um, what what could I be doing that might help advance this cause, even if it's small baby steps? Uh, as a, at the at the front end, so let's uh, let's go around. I think I'm gonna, uh, Me Melanie. I think I'll start with you, and then just uh, work my way around. Yeah, um, you know the thing that I tell state board members, I, really anybody, right, is just ask better questions. So it's really important, you know, when you find yourself in a space that's very new, as I think a lot of state board members are will be in that position, right? Even if they're coming from education, if you don't have um, that grasp on technology to be able to feel good about a recommendation that you're making, just ask better questions. Um, I, you know, it's been right. interesting to me to kind of listen yeah. to the others and see the divide between the states and recognize too, that every state's going to be different. The finances are going to be different and the folks that you're going to need to sign off on some of those things are going to play politics with it. Yeah. I, I love that asking questions. Lou. Uh, yeah, I think I'll just, um, admonish everybody to celebrate the wins big and small. Um, we had a state board meeting earlier this week and the Kentucky School for the Blind got new Monarch devices, braille reading devices. They're tiny held, held, handheld devices, but they will be game changers for those um, blind and visually impaired students. And so thinking about, I'm really proud of Kentucky's history of ed tech integration, but think about all of the innovation that's happening across schools and places where this work is happening, it thrives, and it can be um, exemplary for the rest of the state. So don't miss that opportunity. And I'm going to amplify that, Lou, because I love it. You know, fi find places that are doing great technology integration and having great success with students that go visit those places, elevate them, hold them up as examples. Because a lot of times people hesitate because they, they are not sure what, what different looks like or, or how they can get their school to look different. And by holding up those examples, that gives you both the motivation and a source of information about, okay, what does the change management process look like to go from where we are now to where we really wanna be in terms of how we're using technology? Adrian? I'll just say I had the privilege of two weeks ago going to an event that um, a company called Micron, a semiconductor manufacturer, moving into uh, Clay, New York, they just had, and there was a student there who was very candid about his experience in school today, kind of building back on Julia's point of the 1950s model in 2024, and he was very candid. Obviously, Lou, Melanie, when we go to our meetings, students are very prepped. They're very scripted and we don't get to hear the, the reality of how they really feel. Well, this young man let it rip. And I'll just say like, as us as policymakers are thinking about how to lead in this transition, we have to be extremely student centric. And to your point, Melanie, you hit it on the head, right? I'm learning that sometimes to get to the kids, you got to go through some adults <laughs> and I have managing people um, and getting certain folks on board is um it's a necessary task that we all kind of have to do, but we have to remember who we're doing it for. No, that's a wonderful observation. Elevate student voice. Ki kids, a lot of times they know more about what technology is capable of doing than we do. They have better ideas for how to use it. They're already out there doing it. And it's like, okay, if that's what engages you, how can we make that, you know, integrated into the learning experience? Be beautiful, uh, 
Beautiful addition, Adrian. Thank you for that. Julia, I'm going to give you the last word. And then everybody else, if you're a board member, state board member, hold on. We'll give you instructions, and then we'll pivot into a, a more one-on-one um, uh, -on -one members only discussion with the, uh, the assembled panelists. Go ahead, Julia. I'm going to piggyback on, on Melanie here. I don't think that you need to be a technologist. You do not need to know all of the things. You just need to be able to consider technology in support of the things that you want. Again, I don't see state superintendents or governors putting out digital learning as the top priority, right? They have other priorities, but how does technology go in support of that? And if you have an office of ed tech, you can empower them to really help modernize the system. Uh, they can help support an assistant superintendent of um, special education to understand how technology supports that um, group of students. You can have it for educator development, but the idea is to create that kind of logic model in your head. So you're asking, how does technology support this? And what kind of um, structures do we have in place or policies in place that help promote this idea. And it's not, I, I want to say um, for Adrian, it's not even just like jobs of the future, because sometimes I think people have a hard time conceptualizing <laughs> that. Every single career pathway uses technology in some form or fashion, even agriculture. Can you imagine them not understanding how to use Excel spreadsheets to do data modeling or GIS to map things? They need to have these experiences in schools so that they can pursue their passions and that technology will be in that space when they leave our systems. And we want them to have safe and engaging experiences when they're with us. So I will leave that as my last word. Very good. I want to thank you all as panelists for this uh, public part of our webinar. Uh, so very helpful. I think it gave our uh, listeners uh, and participants a lot of food for thought in terms of strategies they can employ. I'm gonna